Thank Hello, you. and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 17th of October, 2022. I am joined in a rather bizarre week, <laughs> uh, and that's saying something for recent uh, recent weeks and months, uh, as ever, by my co-host, Mr. Andy Brockman. Uh, hello, Andy. How are you doing today? I'm fine. No, I, I just need to explain to our viewer that after negotiations with the national newspaper, uh, I'm actually not going to be doing this week's watching brief. Okay. Uh, in fact, um, given that the um, as the um, prime minister was recently replaced by the, uh, by our good friends at the Daily Star with a lettuce, um, I'm going to replace myself this week with a bunch of bananas. <laughs> because well, that's exactly how this week has been. <laughs> well, they would certainly be more appealing. Oh, I see what you did there. Never mind, never mind. No, no, no. Well, (laughs) regardless of whether or not we'd be better replacing ourselves with edibles. um, No, no, sorry, edibles, that's something else entirely. With fruit, with fruit. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I feel like I've been on edibles uh, or some some bad edibles. But uh, no, in all seriousness, (laughs) our watching brief continues. And uh, this week, we wanted to uh, quickly update you on where the uh, hashtag Attack on Nature campaign is at. Uh, and to sort of think about this in the context of recent events as well, because actually, in that sense, uh, I, 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 who knows what's going to happen next at this point? We may even I have, certainly don't. We may even <laughs> have, have a new uh, a return to Boris Johnson as Prime Minister on Monday. I mean, like, it's just... Uh, it's just bonkers. Anyway, um, mm. so we're going to start with that, and then uh, we have something to talk about, which is actually a good, solid archaeological little little bit of 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 audio for you um it's uh, it's going to be examining the the brilliance of forensic archaeology uh, and we're not going to be talking about that film in that context <laughs> i want to say that at the outset that film, that film. well it's actually much more important than that film and i don't we'll know which later. i don't know which I, I can't imagine which film you're talking about uh but uh but anyway regardless uh let, let's begin though with with that update on uh, hashtag attack on nature um when uh the chancellor was uh sacked um mm-hmm. uh, in recent days uh quasi kwatang um was thrown out and replaced by jeremy hunt uh i mm-hmm. uh couldn't help but think and indeed could see on on social media that actually in no small part uh the campaign uh, by the RSPB, National Trust, and Wildlife Trusts, um, hashtag Attack on Nature, uh, along with lots of other other named in, uh, entities as well, ha- had clearly been part of the pressure that was that was just bearing down on the top two, at number ten and number eleven. Um, the threat to to the environment, the historic environment, and the na- and the natural environment posed by that budget had moved those uh, institutions into action and. Uh, when they move, clearly, uh, along with obviously other, uh, uh, you know, m- movements in the markets, for example, um, uh, events became uh, irresistible, and the chancellor had to go. Uh, was that a, a victory? Do you think for for Attack on Nature? I don't think we can ascribe that victory, if that's what it was, entirely to the um attack on nature hashtag attack on nature campaign which has been promoted by principally by the rspb the national trust um and other leading environment ngos Mm. um but it certainly added to the atmosphere destabilizing the conservative party in westminster Mm. Mm. um it just added to the febrile atmosphere around the government of the now former prime minister liz truss uh, yeah. who resigned um yesterday thursday as we're recording um it, it, it was uh it was symptomatic really of the way that the trust government was pushing forward with its program without taking any soundings without doing any preparation mm. uh, without doing it without even doing any of its we, you know we talked about it at, at, at length last time mm-hmm. um so although um it, as i say what is probably more um, more important in terms of Truss's resignation is the fact that the Tories are now um, sub twenty percent in the opinion polls. Yeah, um, but um, that will be for all sorts of reasons. But uh, but it's uh, it, it certainly put put it this way: 
the attack on nature through the uh, supposed growth plan didn't help her cause. No, no. And we, and we certainly knew that it would be putting pressure on particularly backbench MPs and MPs from, from rural and uh, beautiful parts of, of the country. Um to uh to to at the very least pay close attention to any proposals uh but but where where's the campaign now then i mean is this is this it over i mean it has has the has the, the no. investment zones gone away no far from it um right. and um just by way of background um we are linking this week to a um a, a spreadsheet that's been put together um by a, 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 an author and environmental campaigner called Guy Shrubshall. Um And uh, he's put together a spreadsheet of the proposed mm -hmm. investment zone sites. Mm. Um, as things stand, um, there are, I think, over 70 of them around the country, yes. uh, including a number of ports, but also including, for example, greenfield housing developments in the southeast, mm -hmm. particularly uh, Kent County Council has gone in for... Um, proposed investment zones in quite a serious way, um, including, uh, for example, on um, Manston Airport, an area I know very well and has produced a lot of archaeology in that area. Mm. Um, so, you know, th th um, that is... The, 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 the government is still asking for expressions of interest. Um, it's still... Uh, so, uh, while some local authorities have refused to take part, notably Oxfordshire, and it appears now that also um, Gloucestershire has been blocked uh, mm -hmm. because Stroud District Council, another planning authority, has refused to take part. Um, it's the, the 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 plan is still very much there, um, and in fact, um, the current Leveling Up Secretary, um, a man called Simon Clark, uh, said just th uh, this Monday uh, that although. Jeremy Hunt, the former culture secretary, in fact, but now Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, had said that uh, he was going to cut back on Whitehall spending. Mm. Uh, Clark, who's the levelling up secretary, said that the, quotes, transformational programme, end quotes, would not be derailed by the push to cut government spending. However, while that appears to show, say that you know, the um, investment zone plan is still in play, um, the same article in the Financial Times suggested that it actually might not be um, in play um, quite as seriously as once was, because it quoted a senior Whitehall official with knowledge of the discussions within Whitehall about mm. investment zones, who said, quote, the policy uh, might end up, quote, uh, dead in any significant form. And the reason for that was the Treasury, mm. uh, now headed up by Jeremy Hunt, um, was trying to limit its tax liabilities, which basically, uh, and then they said it's difficult to see how the investment zones can be justified at the moment. The expectation is it will be kept on life support and then quietly killed. The reason for that would be that the Treasury does not want to give away huge amounts of ta um, tax money, right. um, either in direct grants or in tax that wouldn't be collected because of tax breaks for people in investment zones. <sighs> okay, okay. So where so so where are we then? Where is that campaign then? I mean, it, it, you, you say it's. I asked, has it gone away? And it sounds as though it's become far less palatable. Uh, but do you think this this is always going to be a pet project of someone in a conservative government? The conservatives have a record of, as we said last time when we discussed this, mm. uh, of, of trying to quote liberalise planning. Mm -hmm. uh, the Boris Johnson government tried it most recently. Now the trust government that was uh, is uh, was and is trying it. But Which, as before, it's, it, incidentally, I should say as well. I mean, officially, she 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 was in in power for forty four days, was mm -hmm. it? Uh, but yeah. they they there's an estimate has been that she actually only governed really for twelve days because of the, mm. the passing of the Queen, the, few, the state funeral. Um, uh, not as, working as, weekends. Working weekends, yeah, exactly, not working weekends. And also as well, going to um, uh, a UN summit not long after the funeral as well. Yeah. So it's tw in yeah. 12 days, she's done. they've done an awful lot of damage to this country. But, uh, yes. but anyway, sorry, you were saying. So, so uh, it's, 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 a, it's also been a project of, of the Trust Administration. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and... 
you know, at the moment until it's killed off, or mm. as looks more likely, it heads for the um, the long grass out the back of the treasury in what in, in Whitehall where it sits and while that while they do uh, reviews and more spreadsheets and come mm. up with more recommendations and, and whatever but ba basically it's not a white hot project as it seemed to be a few weeks ago okay um at the same time it can't be said to have gone away and nobody should b make any assumptions about that you know it, it 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 was a very serious statement of intent and it's still until it's killed off formally it is still a statement of intent mm. so nobody who's involved in campaigning on either side of the argument um can actually take it for granted that, that it's a it's not uh you know it's a dead project uh meanwhile a couple of days ago i noticed that prospect arcs um tweeted that they'd had a productive meeting at the working group um in response to the uh mm. the poverty report produced by badger um yeah so uh do, do we have any sense of 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 what's next then for archaeology in so much as uh we've seen rspb and others as it were go go to to bat as they say for mm. for both the natural and the, and the historical environment uh, with national trust support as well uh, and the wildlife trusts um and it may well be that due to them and a combination of factors that the immediate threat to the the immediate existential threat to commercial archaeology as a legally mandated and necessary process has subsided somewhat um but this doesn't solve uh well first of all this was not archaeology's doing um uh, as far as i can tell anyway we're not really effectively um but also it doesn't solve the 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 industry problems that we identified in recent watching briefs things like you know the perennial paying conditions, the the uh, the the tendency to to burn through young uh, young bushy eyed, uh, bushy eyed, bushy tailed, bushy -tailed. bright eyed <laughs> archaeologists, um, and not necessarily have have sub substantial career paths uh, for people to, to 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 progress through a life as much as a career uh, do, doing and doing archaeology and being an archaeologist. Um, uh, what, what what do you see on the horizon as far as that's concerned? Because uh, I mean, again, it's it's difficult because uh, all we, all we've really got is positive meeting, constructive conversation. Yeah, mm. we 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 know nothing. No, um, and that's typical of our. And incidentally, bodies. people they don't don't don't, not... don't don't clip that. <laughs> like, we know nothing. <laughs> we know nothing. So go on. Sorry. Yes. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, like like Baldrick in the uh, uh, in, in that in that uh, famous trial. Just say nothing, Baldrick. Yeah. Yeah, Don't yeah. say anything. Yeah. Um, no, look. Um, the, whatever was decided at that meeting, that's not frontline campaigning. No. The frontline no. campaigning is happening uh, through organisations like the RSPB mm. and the National Trust, and. Um, and, and, and in fact, the uh, investment zones are only one part of the hashtag attack on nature, mm. because the second it's a it's a it's a pincer movement uh, from the government or was a pincer movement from the government, and the other part of it was something called the retained EU law bill. Mm. Now that is due back in Parliament, I think, this coming week, and the that was seen as and is seen as just as dangerous to the natural and historic environment as the investment zones could be with liberalized planning mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. what the retained eu law bill does is um ask whitehall departments to look at every piece of legislation in on the uk statute book that was derived from the european union and from our membership of the european union many of which we helped to write mm. and which british meps voted to take on to the eu statute book yeah um and to ex examine each of those pieces of legislation ask are they relevant to britain outside of the eu and if not to either repeal them or allow them to what's called sunset which is mm. basically to cease to be active legislation by the end of 2023 yeah now um among the things that are under threat are aspects of environmental law uh, including, you know, the polluter pays principle, which is 
the principle under which developer funded archaeology takes place mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also things like human rights and workers rights so for example the um limits on the number of hours that your employer can force you to work in a week yeah. without you know um and and, and so on yeah, um, so that, that's the so-called working time directive which, working time directive absolutely which which incidentally is not a limit on how much you can work uh yeah. people often try and portray this as oh oh the government's telling me i can't do a you know a 90 hour week if i want to no yeah. no what they're saying what that law says is that your employer can't insist that you do a 90 hour week um, as it were or that you attempt uh, something uh, uh, Exactly. And it also includes um, directives on air and water policy, pestica pesticide and chemical levels in food yeah. uh, and water, habitat protection. Um, if it all were to go uh, without a like for like replacement, it, it's uh, at, at, at worst a like for like replacements and at best something better, mm. um, which the government did actually uh, say it was going to provide in its 2019 election manifesto. It said it was going to be, provide the greenest government ever. Oh yes. Um, the um, but um, it, it's seen as um, a highly dangerous piece of legislation. I mean, in 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 one line, the the RSPB uh, in sending out a, a a letter which is written to Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Secretary of State um, responsible, the Business Secretary, um, and also in a in a in a, in a Twitter thread, um, that it. it it claims that the bill is unworkable, undeliverable, and ultimately will create nothing but confusion and uncertainty. Mm. And that's before you start looking at the morality of reducing you know, um, protection to the environment across the board, from you know water to creatures to our you know food standards, what stuff, what yeah. food standards and what can be put inside our our own bodies. Yeah. Mm. So um, it. Um, the RSPB and others have sent a letter to Jacob Rees-Mogg. One of the signatories is the uh, Wildlife and Countryside Link, which is uh, a, a, a group organisation, an umbrella organisation, and one of the members of that is the Council for British Archaeology. So do we know, do we know, in, uh, indirectly, the CBA is is, is supporting this yeah, initiative. I mean, like indirectly also, therefore, the CBA w Council for British Archaeology was involved with uh with the the initial wave of the hashtag attack mm. on nature uh yes. but but as member of that that grouping do we does each member have to sort of approve the action of the whole or not or does the whole operate uh in the, i suppose what i'm saying is has the cba mm. actually given approval to 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 be associated with this or they are they just sort of basically just floating along in the in um, the wake the short answer is I don't know. Normally, with something uh, to do with, for example, opposing uh, government, uh, where organisations have legal responsibilities in terms of ch being charities, mm -hmm. and also where they might have funding from government, um, it would be normal practice to circulate a draft before it was published. Mm. But um, I don't know that that's happened in this case. It would, you know, it, it's it's a sensible precaution to do mm. that in case somebody suddenly says, "Well, hey, it wasn't me." So it's, it's like a, you know, MPs are popping up today saying uh, who've been, you know, listed as supporting particularly Boris Johnson in the Conservative candidates uh, candidate race, and um, people have been listed as supporting Boris Johnson and suddenly been tweeting out, "Well, no, actually, no, nobody asked me." No, no. <laughs> so to avoid to avoid that sort of situation, um, it would be sensible, but I don't know for uh, for, for sure. For sure. Uh, what what is for sure, I think, is that many members of the CBA would support the uh the aims of the of the letter and in fact what um the rspb has been asking its members to do is to seek polite reasoned face-to-face -face meetings with their mps to explain their concerns about the, the direction of travel on mm. the environment uh okay so where where uh do we know where other relevant organizations are standing on uh particularly for example the threat to the polluter pays principle uh again i guess as i said that the existential threat's gone away but actually without that principle uh there's no reason to well there's certainly no funding stream i guess for archaeology ahead of um uh be that desk based or you know watching brief or an actual excavation ahead of a building project uh have we had anything anyone moving on that i'm thinking in particular of the federation of archaeological managers and employers or individual units um 
not that I've seen if anybody can point to any anything more than simple you know expressions of concern and we're having a meeting mm. um, please let us know yeah uh, and DMs are open if anybody wants to uh, tell us what has been going on behind the scenes um, we protect our sources mm. but um, mm. it, it given how public uh, you know RSPB the wildlife trusts and national trust and so on have been on this um once again i think we have to report that the equivalent bodies in heritage are some way um behind the curve still mm. a, a friend and colleague a couple of days ago uh described it as being um a situation where the silence is deafening um i couldn't possibly uh, concur with that necessarily I'd, ha I'd have to look into it um <laughs> anyway uh is there anything else on uh hashtag attack on nature that, that we need to know uh, no we... i think yeah. apart from um as i say uh, watch this space look at the spreadsheet of proposed investment zones if, if anybody uh has looked at that spreadsheet and sees uh, anything to do with archaeology or heritage that might be impacted by an investment z uh, zone in your area or an area that you know, mm. please let us know because mm. we'd like to start publicising um, those kind of issues uh, and, and, uh, and, and perhaps then the uh, heritage bodies might start to uh, be more vocal. Yeah, or at the very least be, be more uh, obviously vocal as opposed to, you know, who knows, they might be... You know, jumping up and down and shouting and screaming behind the scenes but uh, we just don't know it mm. and, and, and i need to stress you know as as always archaeologists aren't against change aren't archaeologists most archaeologists aren't against responsible growth um undertaken in a way that is democratic and environmentally appropriate mm. um it, it's simply the dash for economic growth at all costs at the expense of tried and tested legislation to protect the environment that's what the problem is among people who oppose what the government's proposing yeah yeah a watching brief is a formal program of observation and investigation to record and report on notable discoveries on an archaeological site as part of our ongoing watching brief, Andy and I work hard to bring you the best, the worst, and sometimes the more quirky happenings from the world of archaeology. We aim to provide a space where voices can be heard, opinions shared, and sometimes truth spoken to power. If you believe in the work we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Thank you. You had a brilliant idea earlier this week as to uh, what we could bring to the watching brief uh, this week. And uh, and this is uh, uh, a case study in the realm of forensic archaeology. That's right. Mm. Um, it's a, a case study in forensic archaeology, which is possibly one of the most public forms of archaeology in mm. that it actually forms the basis of a lot of, for example, TV detective series where mm -hmm. forensics and forensic archaeology and so on often takes front and centre. Yeah. And the most famous you know, um, TV um, archaeology series ever, probably, Time Team, okay, was... Mo <laughs> I thought you were going to say bone Worst. kickers. <laughs> because, well, because bone kickers had a really explicitly forensic focused kind of element to the drama, didn't it? No, it didn't. It had a absolutely explicitly pseudo archaeological focus to the drama. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it had it had World War One tanks emblazoned with the symbols of the Knights Templar. For goodness' sake! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, which is not to say that something couldn't happen along no, no, those no, lines, no, but yeah, uh, yeah. no, and, yeah. and, and, and a very eminent archaeologist was indeed the yeah. technical advisor for the series. But then I, I understand does try to keep it rather quiet these days. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, no, allegedly, I should say, allegedly, no, allegedly. not true at all. No, no. <laughs> but um, no, look, no, no, fr fr forensic archaeology is, is, is a very public thing. You know, it's, yeah. it's formed the basis of TV series and so on. Um, what we're going to talk about next is a case of forensic archaeology um, which uh, went very publicly very wrong mm. and mm. in a way that is perhaps rather upsetting and I will warn uh, our viewer that 
some things we're going to discuss are really um, very disturbing. Mm. Um, the context of this particular case. Um, and I should also add, uh, add, we are not, but not going to be referencing the new film, The Lost King, because neither of us have seen it yet. And um, therefore, it's not appropriate to comment on that particular piece of art. Although you just did, you just called it a piece of art. Well, yeah, it is. It's a feature film. Well, okay, feature film. I think that's a bit more, a bit more, a bit less sort of obvious as to what it is you're winking at there. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, so let's let's get into it then. What 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 uh, what, what exactly are we talking about? Right. This particular story begins with uh, what's described as an exclusive mm -hmm. um, in the Mail Online. Uh, it was written by Rebecca Camber, who's the crime and security editor for the Daily Mail, um, mm. one of Britain's one of Britain's leading tabloids. And I'm not sure if it still does, but certainly at one stage, Mail Online was the most viewed uh, media website in the world. I think it was. It, it mm. has a massive audience. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. On the 30th of September, the Mail Online published a long article by Rebecca Camber, uh, which was headed exclusive. Skull found in hunt for Ian Brady and Myra Hindley's last victim. Police dig up Saddleworth Moor in search for 12-year-old Keith Bennett, 58 years after he was snatched by Moore's murderers. Mm. Now, this is where uh, I'm not going to go into details, um, People who want to look it up can, although I would urge you be very careful about what you look at in terms of this particular case. It's probably one of the most famous, infamous, and most upsetting cases in recent British criminal justice. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, it involved uh, two people, uh, a man called Ian Brady and his then girlfriend, who was called Myra Hindley, who in the uh, mid 1960s, operating in the area of Greater Manchester, kidnapped and murdered in the most appalling circumstances a number of children. Mm. Um, most of their victims, the remains of most of their victims have been found subsequently. But one victim who hasn't been, whose remains haven't been found, is uh, Keith Bennett, who was 12 years old uh, mm. when he was kidnapped and murdered. And... Uh, is well known from a, um, a, a, a sort of photograph that's almost iconic for the um, of the event of this um, gap tooth kid with National Health Service glasses looking at the camera, yeah. smiling at the camera. Yeah. Um, it was a deeply, deeply upsetting um, event, obviously the most for the families involved. Mm -hmm. um, Keith Bennett's mother never gave up hope that they'd find his remains, but sadly has since died. Uh, but there are still living relatives, including his brother. Mm. Now, um, cut to this autumn. Um, a An author and researcher, I should say a self-styled author, uh, author and researcher called Russell Edwards, uh, claimed that he had conducted a new analysis of information that was on the record from the trial of Hindley and Brady, mm -hmm. uh, that he had pinpointed uh, where he believed uh, Keith Bennett's remains had been buried by Hindley and Brady, and that he had uh, put together, quotes, a team of experts um, to solve the mystery. Um, this involved some freelance digging by Edwards on Saddleworth Moor, where the remains of the other victims were found and where Keith Bennett is believed to be buried. Yeah. Um, he produced photographs of what he claimed were human remains and also pieces of cloth and so on. Uh, and then um, he said... He, it, it had been looked at by an archaeologist um, who, and I'm quoting from the Mail article here, I'm not going to name the person concerned. No. But uh, I am going to describe, uh, it said, archaeologist who specialises in the study of human remains remotely supervised the, quote, grave cut, mm -hmm. using that piece of archaeological terminology. 
this person then said yesterday, quote, I do believe there are human remains there. They, brackets, police, have got to look. Quote, from the photographs I saw, the teeth, I could see the canines, I could see the incisors, I could see the first molar. It's the left side of an upper jaw. There is no way that is an animal. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and they then argued that the person was of the approximately the right age for Keith Bennett, who was um, a young looking 12 when he disappeared. Yeah. Um, this person also quotes analyzed samples from the scene, which she said was, quote, very likely to be adipose tissue and clothing. The conclusions were backed by a second archaeologist. The male is not naming because of her sensitive work, who said, quote, it's a human skull. It cannot be anything else. Um, and then. Uh, Edwards also said he, he, he had um, involved a geologist, who again, I'm not going to name, but her, who the male says, quotes, carried out soil analysis of the scene, which indicated human remains were present. Hmm. Chemical analysis also revealed high levels of calcium and phosphorus, which indicates bones were in the soil. There was also nickel present, which is usually found in zips fastenings, as well as the clothing dye cobalt, would, which would suggest that it is not animal remains and then the university lecturer said quote from my analysis and from my visual impression i would say the area has human remains in it now um and edwards himself is quoted uh he said quote the smell hit me about two feet down like a sewer like ammonia it was on my clothes i stank of it the soil reeked i worked as a grave digger when i was 19 that hits you the smell of death it's distinctive you can see how this is being sort of overcooked by the mm. male for you know, it's a sensation it's a sensational piece of writing well and it's also um uh, uh, um I, don't, I can't quite recall if you mentioned this but it's also an exclusive isn't it for the male so it was it was it was yeah. yes and, and i should say that edwards has past form for working with the male yeah yeah uh he has worked on the mail uh with mail on on other articles now um he he concluded um i was overjoyed then we found the blue and white striped material then i stopped i put everything back as i found it and then the mail says mr edwards believes quote it can only be keith end quote although dna tests will have to be carried out before this is confirmed uh, edwards added this is about peace for keith and closure for the family right. now i'm going to cut forward now to the guardian a week later on the 7th of october mm -hmm. um, search ends for moore's murder victim keith bennett after no remains found Police say a week long examination on Saddlemouth Moor revealed no evidence of human remains. And the article says uh, police have ended a search for Moore's murder victim Keith Bennett without finding any sign of human remains. Forensics officers undertook a week long hunt for the boy's remains after receiving information from an amateur investigator. Russell Edwards, an author, said he was, quote, convinced he had found bones belonging to 12 year old Bennett who went missing in Manchester in 1964. Um, Greater Manchester Police said it had closed the scene on Saddlemouth Moor, having concluded, quotes, there was currently no evidence to indicate the presence of human remains. Now contrast that with what the male was claiming. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, um, the soil samples, um, which um, were claimed, and the material samples which were claimed, uh, and the claims of a skull, uh, the lead detective, uh, Cheryl Hughes, the Great Manchester Police, said the material examined, quotes, hasn't yet indicated the presence of human remains, although more analysis is required, to be fair. Um, Hughes said the photographs appear to show an item, quote, considerably smaller than a juvenile jaw, draw, jaw. and this is the kicker, it cannot be ruled out that it is plant-based. In other words, it might even just have been a plant root. Ah, oh, yeah, so it could have been like a tuber or something. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, the um, police said that they wouldn't close the file on Keith Bennett's disappearance until um, the family had answers. Um, and they've said that uh, the, the, the assistant chief constable, very senior officer in Greater Manchester Police, shows how sensitively 
how sensitive this particular issue was. Mm. Um, they said, um, uh, Chief, Assistant Chief Constable Sarah Jackson said, we've always said that we would respond in a timely and appropriate manner to any credible information which may lead us towards finding Keith. Mm. Our actions in the last week or so are a highly visible example of what a response looks like with the force utilising the knowledge and skills of accredited experts, specialist officers and staff. It is these accredited experts and specialists who have brought to us a, to such a position that we can say that despite a thorough search of the scene and ongoing analysis of samples taken both by ourselves and a third party, mm. which was Edwards, there is currently no evidence of the presence of human remains at or surrounding the identified site on Saddlemont Worth Moor. However, I want to make it clear our investigation to find answers to, for Keith's family is not over. And to give you an idea of the human cost of this mm -hmm. um keith bennett's brother alan who i mentioned earlier is his closest surviving relative um he wrote on facebook um that the issue was causing the family ongoing pain anguish and distress uh, that runs through all of keith's siblings and then filters down through the next generations and then he added I have to explain these things to my own grandchildren in more detail recently, and the older they get, the more questions they have. I'm struggling to explain what makes certain people tick and behave the way they do. This latest example being one of the most difficult to even attempt to explain. That That is to say, the latest example of, of uh, an amateur detective going very public with this before anything's really been confirmed. Precisely so right. That. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, um, just, now, just, 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 I don't know if you're about to sure. address this, but just before you continue, um, what about, again, we're not naming them, but what about the archaeologists and, uh, I mean, one of them isn't named, but also the the geologist involved? Like, what, uh, mm. um, how, uh, do you think maybe they, they had made, you know, personal comments, you know, off the, you know, not off the record, but back and forth in email or something based on photographs and hadn't been there? Uh, um, I'm not quite sure. How, how do you? It sound. It sounds as though this is written to sound as though an archaeologist was convinced that they saw skull and teeth that can only yes. be human. Yes. Um, what? What's what's going on there? I think what's going on there is something I've got experience of in my own career, where mm. um, and, it, and this happened in, in a much more. Uh, a much less emotionally sensitive way over the Burma Spitfires, the very Burma Spitfires that weren't, mm -hmm. the, the very Burma Spitfires hoax, mm -hmm. where um, people who aren't necessarily particular specialists but are, do have university tenures mm -hmm. with the best will in the world, trying to be helpful and because they were interested, um, answered questions from a member of the public. Right. And answered questions to the best of their ability within the information that they had. Mm. Um, now, obviously, this wasn't um, hedged around so much with issues of professional ethics and particularly law. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need a, a license to uncover a human burial, whether it's accidental or deliberate, mm -hmm. whether it's a murder victim or somebody who's died naturally and been buried. Anybody who's worked on an archaeological site knows that you take out, you usually take out a home office license as a precaution in case you find any human remains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to enable the work to continue rather than have to stop while you involve the coroner and the police and so on. Mm. Um, or at least con to continue as expeditiously as possible. Um, so, you know, the, we're into an area where there are, uh, it, there are legal grey areas. Personally, as, an, as, a, you know, as a professional archaeologist, and I'm sure you'd be the same, if somebody came to me and said, I think I found human remains, the first thing I would say is, well, then you need to call the police and the local coroner. Yeah, it's yeah. not you know that they, they will then involve archaeologists as needs be. Yeah, you know. Well, uh, yes. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, in that sense, the Archaeosuit Facebook page uh, occasionally um, receives requests to identify artifacts. But there was one instance mm -hmm. where someone did say, "Does this look like a human bone?" Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, without a scale, without any sort of context, it was just a bone basically mm -hmm. on a table. And yeah. it could have been, but I didn't say yes or no. I just said, uh, if it is a human bone, as you say, you, you know, there are questions to be answered and, and you should consider reporting this to the police, you know? And so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so, sorry. So where, where were you going with that line of, th of thinking? Then? Are you suggesting that, 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 that we shouldn't 
I'm trying to word this in a way that it's not directly critical, but that we shouldn't rush to to say, oh, that could, that could be a bone, that could be a human, that could be a skull, that kind of thing. Especially if we haven't, if we're not actually there. Okay, um, I'll answer that um, by first of all quoting a statement that was released by the Charter Institute for Archaeologists mm. on the thirteenth of October. Um, it was a um, after consideration um, of this particular incident mm. by CIFA. Um, who not only um, accredit archaeologists, not legally, but so, but it's generally accepted now. It's the professional sort of gold standard for um, professional training and ethics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and not, not only that, they have a specific forensic archaeology expert panel, the FAEP, mm. which monitors forensic archaeologists and keeps a list of CIFA accredited forensic archaeologists okay uh the kind of people that the police were quoting when they talked about their expert forensics people at mm. saddleworth mall this time mm. what they said you may have seen reports in the press about recent excavations at saddleworth mall in the search for murder victim keith bennett unfortunately someone who is neither C a cfa cifa accredited professional archaeologist nor an accredited member of CIFA's Forensic Archaeology Expert Panel interpreted the evidence incorrectly, albeit in good faith, contributing to the requirement for a large-scale excavation. During this latter search, a CIFA accredited forensic archaeologist was instrumental in excluding the area from suspicion. Right. And then the statement goes on to say, the issues caused here highlight why forensic archaeologists need a clear understanding of their role in forensic investigation and their obligations as an expert. Forensic archaeology is an important part not only of archaeology but also of crime scene investigation dealing with very sensitive issues including the gathering of evidence for murder trials, helping people and communities come to terms with loss, achieve peace and, recon and, 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 achieve peace and reconciliation. This requires both archaeological skills and an in-depth understanding of the legal framework within which they operate. For this reason, accredited forensic, accredited forensic archaeology professionals work to a standard of, for forensic archaeological work published by CIFA and endorsed by the Forensic Science Regulator, that's a government um, body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, again, because you're dealing with the law and evidence that's put in front of courts certain procedures have to be absolutely clear transparent there has to be chain of evidence people have to be appropriately qualified to comment and so on mm. um and they conclude the issues raised above have highlighted the need for greater understanding of the legal context for forensic archaeology and the difference between mainstream and forensic work Towards this goal, the, um, the Forensic Archaeology Expert Panel feels that greater collaboration with the uh, um, special in interest groups and broader seat for membership is needed, not least to help um, special interest group members become competent forensic practitioners. Um, for our discipline to be viable, there must be a transparent career progression with which younger colleagues can progress and future-proof forensic archaeology in the UK. This, however, needs to be balanced for, that, um, uh, for the need for confidentiality in active casework and the inevitable worse workloads of active forensic archaeology expert panel members. Mm. So there's a sort of hint there at the end uh, of the, the same issues that we've been talking about previously about um, sustainable careers and career progressions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what is absolutely clear there is that uh, you can argue somebody who perhaps sitting back and thinking about it, albeit, as they say, in good faith, made comments and identifications that they really shouldn't have done no hmm, hmm. and I, I suppose it's worthwhile saying though i can see why one might fall into that trap uh because you know it's not it, it, archaeo all well most many archaeologists I, i'll say are in a often a socially uh a culturally unique or specific uh place in so much as for example i you know i've handled human remains you've you've I presumably have, have handled or been near to human remains at some point you know yes. Uh, yes. um and you can see what you know i've had lots of conversations with people 
normally of an evening with friends and family or just you know just interested others where they ask oh what's it like what's it like you know seeing a grave or handling a skull or something like that. and and you know you you one tries to be uh sober and serious and 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 indicate that sort of duality a sense of responsibility to be precise in your work but also the profound nature of what it is that you're often doing when you come across a uh, come across human remains um in in almost any context um but therefore you can see why it's easy to sort of fall into that trap of thinking well i know what a human what a human skeleton looks like in the ground you know i've seen one i've i've or i've seen many who knows you know um uh, and and so if someone sends you a photograph, you might feel as though you are able to to render analysis, to to offer an opinion. Um, is it, yeah, this is an interesting case study. This one, it's, it's a curious one, and but also it highlights the the important role, one of the important things that CIFA does do uh, in in yes. in monitoring this this sort of work and the quality of it. Um, so, so how, how? I mean, you know, you said you weren't going to talk about Richard the Third, but why did you no. think? Why did you think this would this would stray in that direction? I'm curious. Well, because obviously um, the Leicester University Archaeology Unit excavation, um, the the whole publicity round, um, but was based on the fact that uh, the combination of a historian. Mm and their forensic work in recovering the skeleton and then carrying out DNA work on the skeleton based on evidence uh, of a family line provided by historians um, was able to conclusively prove that the skeleton that they found in that grave cut in that car park was Richard III killed at the Battle of Bosworth. Right, I see. Um, I see. And that... Um, you know, and, uh, uh, and, uh, you know that that that's forensic archaeology, historical forensic archaeology done properly. Now we're dealing here with a very live investigation of one of the most appalling serial murders in British criminal history. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where there are still living relatives, close living relatives of the victims, so the sensitives are far greater than a king who died in 1485. Mm. The, the, the actual sensitivities, is the actual emotional sensitivities mm. and, and, and i'm forgetting you know that obviously anybody in archaeology who deals with human remains knows that it has uh there's an, there's an emotional um if not price there there's emotional baggage that you carry when you deal with human remains yeah um you can't it can't yeah, no you can't help not be sensitive as a human being and and, and you know particularly particularly you know if you're dealing with the uh, the remains of for example children mm. um but um uh, the other thing i'd say I, I would say on this and 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 you know okay again most i'll say at the moment is the the lost king the recent which the third film has proved controversial i'm not i've not seen it yet i'm not going to make any comments about it mm -hmm. um but i can comment on Russell Edwards because in 2014 um, Mr. Edwards um, published a book called Naming Jack the Ripper um, okay. where one of the taglines was we finally solved the mystery who, of Jack, who Jack the Ripper was and then adding we have unmasked him mm. Now, Edwards claimed that he had obtained a silk shawl that had belonged to one of the Ripper, Jack the Ripper, the, uh, the, the, the serial killer who's called Jack the Ripper, uh, one, one of the women he killed, Catherine Eddowes. Mm. And he claimed that he had extracted evidence from the shawl proving incontrovertibly she was killed by a Polish Jew called Aaron Kosminski, who was the same as the Kosminski who is named and exonerated by police officers investigating the alleged serial murders in 1888 and 18, in the 1890s. And that story then went viral. Mm. Um, the Liverpool Echo apparently um, uh, reported that uh, there was a film in the offing. Um, one of uh, Ed Edwards suggested that um, Daniel Craig might play Kosminski. One of his collaborators, who was from Liverpool John Moores University, hoped that he, the 
academic that Edwards had spoken uh, had worked with might be played by Johnny Depp. Um, okay. Now, as it turned out, the sort the, the silk shawl had allegedly been obtained by a Metropolitan Police officer who was called Amos Simpson. And it was claimed that he'd obtained it at or near Mitre Square in the city of London, where the body of Catherine Eddowes was found. Um, in fact, uh, historians found out that Simpson, although he was a Metropolitan Police officer, had absolutely no jurisdiction in the city of London, on the edge of which was Whitechapel, where the murders took place. And in fact, was stationed at Chesham, which is 25 miles away on the other side of London. Right. Okay. Um, and that the shawl um was probably misidentified um and there was absolutely nothing to connect it with any of the rape uh, of, of the serial killer known as jack the ripper's women victims no no um so and <clears throat> It's a whole, basically, it was a whole, it, you know, it, it, it was an ancient aliens argument. My fact is my fact, therefore, that fact is that also my fact, and this proves my theory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it's, the, it's people setting out to prove a theory as opposed to disproving a hypothesis, yeah. Exactly that, yeah, exactly yeah. that. Mm. Um, he claimed, for example, that um, there have been, uh, semen have been extract, uh, extracted from the shawl, but another scientist who examined the alleged semen stain uh, said, I would have expected to see them, uh, sperm heads, uh, if they'd been there. Cells like that are found in other bodily fluids, including saliva and sweat, etc. Hmm. Um, so, you know, again, his his con incontrovertible evidence wasn't. It no. was certainly, if it was evidence at all, it was it was a, uh, able to be interpreted in different ways. So this, so um, so more broadly, then, are you saying that, that this is someone who who is looking for a headline? Uh, if not this for is Hollywood somebody, production. yeah. This is somebody who is looking for a headline. Uh, it, it can be argued, mm. and uh, I would also. I, I didn't. Uh, now, when I started this, I, I didn't mention that the book naming Jack the Ripper had been covered. I think I said it had been covered ex uh, in, in the press. In fact, the media outlet that covered naming Jack the Ripper by Russell Edwards, the man who appears to have misidentified. Uh, or at least failed to identify Jack the Ripper in spite of his claims, and then failed to identify human remains in one of the most sensitive murder inquiries in British criminal history. The paper he collaborated with on Jack the Ripper, as well as on the Keith Bennett search, was the Mail. Right. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. So, but really, the Mail. The Mail needs to. Uh, his contact needs to take take uh, take his. Uh, leads with a pinch of salt <laughs> it sounds like at the very least i mean um well, thing is, you know, the, 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 the mail hasn't done anything illegal no somebody's gone to it with the story yeah. and it's published the story yeah um i think what we can regret and what sifa clearly regrets mm. is that first of all that the story was given credibility by people identifying themselves as archaeologists mm. when and certainly again although it is not a legal requirement to comment on such a story to be a member of CIFA's expert group. No. In this kind of sensitive circumstance, it would certainly help mm -hmm. if you had a certain amount of a recognised expertise in the subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 and I know I, I was talking to people with forensic experience when this story first broke, and they thought it stank to high heaven. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 what, what was being claimed just would not be the case. No. Uh, other people, and in fact, people went on the record in uh, in other news outlets to um, to, to say that, albeit often uh, anonymously because of for, for professional reasons. Yeah. But um, you know, no, no, nobody with any credibility gave this any this story any any room at all. It was it was clearly something that had been um, well at best it was wishful thinking. At worst, it was a cynical marketing ploy for a book. Yeah. Or TV program forthcoming. We don't know that, but uh, no, no, no. But 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 it's... as you say, the the use of such ghoulish language describing the mm. smell and all that kind of thing was, uh, yeah, yeah. It was it was yeah. um, what's the word? Uh, sensationalist. Um, yeah, mm. it's not the language that any ethical professional would use. No, no. including mo ethical professional authors. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, especially well, especially if you if you're apparently trying to solve, uh, the, yeah, the location of such a such a a delicate and sensitive and, and ongoing. Uh, I mean, because that photo, I, I will put his face on the thumbnail for this video, just just so people know mm. what we're talking about. But that photo is a photo that I I remember. You know, I've, it's always been there. It turns up every now and then mm. on the news, uh, sometimes yeah. in documentaries. It's it, it's an it, it's an icon of a tragedy, of a truly tragic Indeed. loss of a of a little boy, and 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 the fact that I do remember. Um, yeah, every now and then you'd hear from his mum on the news, mm. and then when when his mum. Uh, did die. I, I remember feeling quite sad actually, just thinking oh, she, mm. she, she never got closure. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So as you say, using that kind of language around that story, around that case, is uh, it, it's, it's it's another red flag, isn't it? Definitely. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Ah. And, uh, yeah. And, and as I say, you know, um, I think the, the lesson there for any archaeologist actually mm. is when somebody rings you up and asks you a question. Mm. Do your homework, look into the background yeah. and think very carefully before you say anything. And, and particularly if there's a possibility it might end up in the media, mm. which is not to say that the media are the enemy, quite the opposite. No, no, no. But if you're dealing with, with the victims of of uh, of those two infamous serial killers, I don't want to keep on yeah. talking about them um, no. or naming them, uh, then, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, there's a high likelihood threshold that it's going to end up somewhere. Um, Absolutely. Okay, well, uh, I guess that's been that's been watching brief for this week. Uh, interesting, I think fairly fairly meaty topics there. Um, where what's next? Do you know what 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 we might be talking about next week? <laughs> like like I, I suppose um, because cause I, I, as I've said in recent watching briefs, this isn't Prime Minister Watch. Uh, this no. is watching brief, and uh, but but at the same time, whoever comes in. Uh, are on pro probably on Monday. It sounds as though they're determined not to have to have a drawn out six week process choosing the next prime mm -hmm. minister. Um, whoever comes in, it'll have a, an imp an impact on who sits in the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. It'll have an impact on economic policy. Um, although apparently, I think the the, the current chancellor uh, wants to stay in role if he can. Um, but uh, regardless. If they, if one of their pet projects is uh, the watering down of planning or the the relationship of you know sunsetting European legislation with regards to polluter pays, then I guess we'll have to we'll have to examine it, won't we? Look, I think in a very dark way, the the story of the search for the remains of Paul Keith Bennett um, has highlighted the fact that archaeology doesn't just happen. Archaeology happens in communities and it happens and its impact can be on people and sometimes very directly on people. Mm, mm. And that's why I, I, I've always said that archaeology, we can't just treat it as archaeology. We have to treat it where appropriate as part of news and current affairs. Yeah. And I think that's where we are at the moment. Okay. Well, we'll see what's current next week, I suppose. Um, and uh, and also next week, uh, it'll be Halloween week here at Archeo Soup Towers. The the office is decorated, um, and uh, uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm 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 a bit tired this year. Um, a wee wee bit uh, drawn out, but I, I think it'll be fun. Uh, but uh, but with that in mind, um, do keep an eye out for uh, next. Uh, no, so on actually on Halloween night itself. Uh, we'll be doing a live stream of um, spooky archaeological tales that people will be sending in. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Regardless of what of, of what's coming next on Watching Brief, you can look forward to that next week from me. And, if, and actually, if anybody wants any um, entertaining um, pre-Halloween reading, just get a, uh, get a hold of a copy of Collected Short Stories of M.R. James, who wrote brilliant spooky stories um, yeah. at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, often involving historians and archaeologists. Yeah, I, I actually I have a, I have a, I have a copy of uh, a collection of those stories uh, on my shelf. Ah, right, guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for your time, as ever, Andy. Uh, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.